Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Dmitry Levin. Uh, I am the chief software architect at Basalt, where we do GNU Linux operating system. But I'm also the maintainer of S-Trace for the last, uh, slightly more than last 10 years. So uh, today I'll be talking about postmodern S-Trace. Uh, what is postmodern S-Trace? Uh, I used to talk about modern S-Trace uh, last year, so I understood that I can name it modern S-Trace any longer if I'm talking about very recent features. So where where traditional S-Trace ends and modern S-Trace begins, uh, and when modern S-Trace ends, well, mod S -trace, modern S-Trace never ends, so when it turns into postmodern, uh, well, it's kind of subjective, so well, my definition is very simple, that the S-Trace that was before I started maintaining it is traditional, and all the rest is modern, and yeah. <laughs> So here it goes. And uh, well, postmodern is all new features since the last talk at Fosdem. <laughs> so I'll be covering mostly what have changed for the last two years. But I'll remind you briefly about traditional features ju just to just to refresh these features in your memory. So Trace is a mostly Linux system called Tracer. It also can not just trace, but tamper the system calls since like several years ago. Uh, but it has a lot of options to control its behavior in different ways, like whether it prints instruction pointers, whether it prints timestamps or not, how it prints strings, uh, what system calls are printed and which way they are printed, what's abbreviated and what's not. Uh, there are also options to control what signals are printed. Uh, it can also dump uh, the data that goes through descriptors. Uh, it can print its output in different ways. So you can, for example, redirect it into a pipe or collect, uh, collect output for each process separately. Uh, yeah. A lot of features that control or what syscalls would be printed. Uh, it can also print statistics on system call invocations. It can attach to already existing processes. It can follow forks and it can don't follow forks, depending on whether you specify the option. Well, that was traditional. There were also quite a few options added for the last 10 years. Like you can print a lot of details about uh, about descriptors, like what paths are associated with them, or what socket information is behind sockets when these de descriptors are sockets. We can bring a uh, stack of user function calls. Uh, yeah, you can filter, filter system calls by path names. We finally got support for regular expressions for filtering system calls. So you can specify which syscalls are printed using regular expressions and so on. Yeah, more ways to control how statistics is printed, uh, what is being, how is it's traced. So you can, for example, attach to many processes. You can run this trace as a detached process and so on and so on. Well, and there's also this big feature which changes this trace, uh, uh, I mean, it, change not just the stress, but the way how people look at it. It's system call tampering. So you can not just trace system calls, but also inject uh, various things, like starting with return code. Also, you can inject signals and delays. But this, this all was more or less covered in the previous talk. So in the last two years, we got ptrace get syscall info support it went both into the kernel and in, into strays. We got system call return status filtering. Uh, we have SICOMP assisted uh, syscall filtering nowadays. There are also a lot of new system calls in the kernel that are supported. 
and we have like, more and more elaborated system called parsers. We also finally have long options. <laughs> yeah, we had no choice. <laughs> you will soon see why. And finally, a, a bit more than a year ago, we, we changed our, our BSD style licenses to a, a copyleft license. So let's start with the first feature. Uh, well, the story itself started very, very long. T like, I think it was 2001. Then this new architecture, X8664, appeared. So the way it was uh, added in Linux kernel, obviously, was to, to support both 64 and 32-bit uh, processes for obvious reasons, because it was the main, like, feature this architecture compared to its competitor that it could run legacy code. And in early years of this, uh, there were a lot of legacy code and very little native 64-bit code. But the way it was Im implemented in the kernel, it allowed not just to mix uh, instructions, but also mix system call invocations. So you could actually invoke from a native code both uh, native 64 uh, bit system calls, but also uh, legacy 32-bit syscalls. And it was very poorly documented, if at all. Uh, it was very surprising to many people. Uh, and it wasn't really exposed in the kernel API. So yeah, what user space trace and debuggers could do, they could fetch the system call number. Uh, they could like fetch this syst uh, register that describes the bitness of process. And then they would just guess, uh, do the wild guess, and say, well, if the process is 64-bit, then probably the syscall is also 64-bit, right? It's mostly the case. And if it's a 32-bit process, then syscall is definitely 32-bit. And all the logic depended on this wild guess. And it's, it mostly works because in most cases it's, it's exactly what what happens, but sometimes it's not the case. And back in 2008, there was a bug report against strays <coughs> in Debian bug tracker. Uh, there is a very simple example that looks, uh, you can see are, are very similar to it. It's somewhat sim simplified compared to the one reported in that bug report. So the program does a very simple thing. It just prints a line of output uh, so, and then it invokes a 32-bit system call, and then it prints another line of output. But this 32-bit syscall is actually a fork. So what happens is that there are two processes, the, and each of them prints the line. So if you compile a uh, link and run this program, you'll see uh, an output similar to this. Uh, Maybe P numbers will change, but all the rest will be just very simple. But if you run this very simple program under stress, you will see something very strange. So you will see this line is being printed, and then suddenly a process attaches, and then you see this ridiculous open system call with very, very odd, very impossible, I would say, are arguments. But <laughs> all you can say about this is <laughs> what? Uh, and all the rest looks very usual and regular, uh, making the whole picture completely ridiculous. Like this ridiculous open among all nice expected system calls. So yeah, uh, if you run this program several times, you will see that all these odd open flags are different. You will never see the same combination, or probably never see the same combination of flags. Uh, because nowadays, thanks to kernel address randomization, uh, all these re register contain garbage that changes. And this reminds me of a, of a toy, toy I had in my childhood, a kaleidoscope. 
you turn it slightly and you see a different, different nice picture. So you can use this simple program uh, as a kaleidoscope if you like. <laughs> yeah, so this problem was like, approached several times, but until, until 2018, there was no progress. And finally, well, thanks to uh, two people who <laughs> contributed this um, uh, API in the kernel, and uh, two, yeah, there are two authors and 20 more people who reviewed this, and I could buy it at, at the sign bias. It took us uh, almost nine months to get this into the kernel, and like, don't remember how many iterations, uh, but it was two digit number of iterations. So finally we have it in the, in the kernel, and for all architectures that support trace hooks, which are like all supported architectures, or almost all, I would say, and some that are not supported but get it for free. We, we have this, and yeah, the API looks this way. There is a structure you can request from the kernel. It contains this crucial architecture field, uh, and in other ways it looks similar to SECOMP data. So you can obtain in, in one go both the architecture, uh, the syscall number, syscall arguments, also instruction pointers, temp pointer, and this is uh, this makes uh, traces that use this API reliable in this respect, in respect to the original problem. So the same program now looks uh, if the if Linux is fresh enough and the trace is fresh enough, you see this is like as expected. So process attaches, you see the proper fork call and not this ridiculous open, and all, all looks good. So I think other traces and debuggers that have something to do with the system calls should switch to this API. Uh, by the way, it also allows uh, to, to find out what kind of ptrace stop is uh, the, the current stop. Otherwise, or up to this time, kernel provided no way to find out. Uh, so they used to think that they alternate. So first you enter syscall and then exit syscall, but it's not always the case. So you actually can use this nice API to find out and the, what is the, actually the PTA stop you're dealing with. Okay, so it was a very like, major feature for his trace. Uh, and I, yeah, as I said, some other, other traces are welcome to use this, of course. Let's speak about system call filtering. Uh, there is a new option to filter system calls by return status. Uh, it had a very like, unusual history for a trace. So it was actually introduced like in 2002, but it was broken from the beginning. Uh, it was never announced. You couldn't find it exists unless you accidentally <coughs> type it in or look into the source code because it, it was broken. So it, what it did, uh, it printed uh, the beginning of system call and when it failed, it just didn't print the ending. It, it wasn't useful. But now you can filter uh, system calls by return status. So you can print only those uh, system calls that are succeeded or those that are failed. So in this very simple example, you can see the difference. Well, if you run a very simple program like cat uh, with, a, yeah, with a modified LD library path, it, it makes a dynamic linker to look into a different in different places. I wonder whether, whether you expect dynamic link to, to look into so many different places. But, well, you can see the difference. Uh, uh, as a very useful side effect of this uh, option, you can have an aggregation for free. So, for example, if you trace several processes that are running asynchronously, and then you will see a lot of this unfinished and resumed stuff. 
and sometimes it's not very convenient. We used to implement uh, special uh, aggregators to collect this data so it would look like this. But now thanks, you can use this uh, option also to aggregate. The only, the only need, I would say, is that it might change the order of invocations. So in this example, it looks like if nanoslipsis calls were invoked sequentially, uh, which is definitely not the case, they were invoked simultaneously, but because they were printed at, at the moment they finished uh, these system calls, it looks not the way uh, you are used to. But then you, when you are aggregating, it doesn't really matter uh, in which order they are printed. So the, yeah. there is also the, another option uh, that um, there is a funny story connected with it. So when I try to come up with, a, with a something useful as an example, I started, um, I started invoking all programs I had in my small, uh, build, uh, small chirut, and I found, I found out a few programs that were not printing, uh, <laughs> not printing their arguments correctly, then they couldn't find them. I just invoked programs with a non-existing file. Yeah, and I found two of these programs in LFutils, and I fixed them, but you can get an idea when this could be useful. For example, when program doesn't print uh, what's going on, you can uh, like trace and have a look. Uh, when you are filtering, uh, this, when you are filtering system calls, you probably don't want to, uh, if you don't want to print all the rest, you probably want to uh, make the, those system calls you are not printing execute <coughs> faster. And now we have a very nice feature, which we planned for several years, but couldn't get uh, until, well, we had two GSOC Google Summer Course students uh, in, the year before last, the student uh, made a, a prototype, and yeah, and last year uh, we had a student who is going to talk about this feature very soon, I hope. So he will describe how it works. But from user perspective, it looks like trace is no longer no longer delays everything by two orders of magnitude. Uh, on those system calls that are not traced. So in this, yeah, it's a famous example uh, because uh, the, this, is this is a modification of example uh, BPF people uh, use to, um, to describe how, how slow a trace is. And now we use the BPF stuff <laughs> to show how fast a trace is. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that uh, uh, Secom BPF itself slows down things about 10%, uh, which is nothing compared to what uh, all these P-trace stops do with the speed of running programs. Uh, yeah, you can see this is a long option, and it was actually the first option that we couldn't find a good uh, short analog. So we had quite a few, not as many as LS program has, but quite a few options and some of them are not obvious. And we had a, I think, what is it, dash n is in our prototype, but we could, couldn't find an explanation what, why it should be called dash n. So we decided that it's time to introduce long options. And now we are started adding aliases for not so obvious names. Uh, yeah, so second paper was the first one. Uh, another option, which should probably have a, uh, a, a long option analog and is the option that has name dash k. I don't know why it's called dash k. It prints a stack, stack of uh, uh, user, user calls at the time of system call invocation. Yeah, it's a very useful thing because you can see the logic that behind the program 
If you don't know what's going on, you can just apply this. It will produce a lot of output, but it, it makes makes a trace somewhat kind of debugger more than a tracer. So in this example, you can see why why, for example, cat closes is a doubt. Uh, from names of these functions, you can see that it does uh, some kind of uh, exit uh, handling. Uh, and it closes it out to ensure that everything is written. Otherwise, it should return non-zero exit code. Yeah. Another option, uh, you can attach, uh, you can use a trace uh, as a detached process. So because, because this trace affects uh, traces in different ways, uh, it's not always desi desirable. For example, if these processes uh, interact with their parents and they know they want to know their PID numbers, so you can run a trace uh, uh, this way and be more transparent. Yeah, there is also a, a relatively new option that that says how uh, all these symbolic constants should be printed. Uh, so you can print as usual, uh, like translate these numbers into symbolic names. So you can print both symbolic numbers uh, and and raw numbers or just raw numbers. It has like, ver various useful implications. You can, uh, you can debug programs that you suspect you uh, pass uh, arguments uh, to system calls in a wrong way, which is not very surprising because on different architectures there are different system call, uh, uh, different a ABIs, uh, the different number uh, and order of passing system, uh, system call arguments. And this is also can be used. I think it's used in syscall project. So yeah, we added support for all new system calls that were added into the Linux kernel. And nowadays they started adding system calls again. So yeah, like bunch of few, bunch of new system calls that work with mount points. With, well, I can't describe them all. There, there are too many. You should reverb look into man pages probably, but we have support for them. Uh, we also have a lot of very sophisticated sophisticated uh, uh, system called parses, uh, and I'll show you an example which looks them very monstrous, but you will get the idea how sophisticated system called parses could be. So we support decoding of net, netlink protocol, and uh, you can see this Output. This is the output of a very simple routing table, and here you can see what's going behind. Yep. So you you see this netlink protocol is very structured. It has some structures, substructures, sub substructures, and everything is printed. Uh, color, coloring is mine. All the rest is made by trace. Yeah. And the last but not least is that in December of 2018, we changed the license. So Astrace used to be released since the very beginning under Beckley style license. Uh, so it, it was a, 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 yeah, by request of Paul Kreinbuch. I don't know this man. It was too early. So when we added support for Trace gets his call info API. It was kind of crucial point. Uh, most contributors to Strays didn't want to contribute under permissive license any longer, so we decided we would have a change to copyleft. Uh, so test suite is released under GNU GPL V2 plus, and all the rest is uh, is a license that allow us to release this. Uh, as a library someday in the future if we manage to make a library out of this trace. Yeah. So this is more or less what I wanted to talk about. And if you have some questions or ideas or something related to this trace to discuss, we have some time. Yeah. Uh, should I repeat the question? Yes. Oh, so please be, be concise. <laughs> uh, 
should I pick yeah from the back to the front yeah So the question was uh, why this Secomba system, system called filtering, is not by default, and why you, you have to type this very long option to, to use this feature. Uh, first of all, you can abbreviate long options, so uh, you don't have to type that much. I think, I think two letters is usually enough. If not, then type three letters. Uh, some, uh, some shells allow uh, expansions of, co of program arguments. So I don't think this is a problem. But, well, <coughs> there, is a, there are two important points about this way of filtering. Is first, it, it generates and attaches a, a BPF program. Uh, I'm not going to dive into details, but it makes this program and you can attach it, but you can't get rid of it unless you're privileged. So this implies that you have to follow forks. You have to follow all processes that are forked by the process you are tracing. And this kind of change behavior. And one of important points of a trace is that a trace is backwards compatible. So we can't enable follow forks by default because people are not used to this. Uh, yeah. And if you specify this option and do not specify follow forks, it says that I am enabling follow forks Hey, so uh, this is one point. Another point is that unless you are privileged, and a trace is used as a privileged program, you can't attach a BPF program to another process. So you can attach, attach to a process using ptrace sys or ptrace attach, but you can't attach a BPF program to another process. You can only attach a, a BPF program to yourself. So. Uh, one of important features of a trace is to uh, a trace already existing process wouldn't work with this unless you're privileged. But if you're privileged, you can use a lot of kernel tracing nowadays. It's not really a big deal, although they don't have so elaborate traces. Yeah, yeah, please, another question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that on the last slide that the color was your, your own. Uh, would you consider adding color output to S trace? So the question was that on this slide, the color was my own, and would I consider coloring by a trace? It's kind of, this is a difficult question because uh, we had actually a plan to generate a structured output from a trace. And if you generate, for example, some JSON output, you would apply already existing software to do all this fancy stuff like coloring. Uh, so we decided we will make structured output first, and then other people will do whatever coloring they like. But as you can see, uh, there is no structured output yet, and I have to do all the coloring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Could you pretty print that? Sorry? Could you pretty print that with the indentation of new line? Uh, me? No, no. I, I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was whether I can pretty print this. I think this is pretty enough. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was your question? Well, I'm just saying it's like quite hard to read a block of text like that. It's broken into Whether I can print this in blocks so it will be easy to read. <laughs> yeah, it's getting closer and closer to our idea of structured output. So, yeah, you can see why we decided to go the simple way, but was not so simple. Is it over? Yes. Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs>